What are you doing? You were flanking you. All right. We were flanks. Everybody got one? You good? All right. Just want to make sure you got it right. As soon as Garrett Graves get up, we'll begin. Well, we're glad to be back in the free state of Florida um, for our House GOP conference. I know it's a difference between the Democrats and Republicans. Um, they worried about what to call theirs, and then I've never seen a, a conference of the Democrats who say not one person in their conference has brought up gas prices. I wonder why they won't bring it up, because they know who caused it. But over a year ago, at our last conference, we created these task forces. The task forces were created to go out to listen to the American public, have everybody in the conference participate, to be able to find the solutions for America to a lot of the problems the Democrats have created. You've watched, we've been able to roll out a number of them from the Parents' Bill of Rights to securing our border. But one of the real challenges we continue to hear across this country is the rising prices from everything you think about, from the grocery store. You see the gas price today. And what that means is, under the Biden administration, it's going to cost every American family $6,000 more dollars, just because what is rising. It's not the only thing rising. And really, the question has to be asked, can we afford them? Can we afford their policies? Where the gas prices rise, where home prices rise, where your rent rises, where the milk, eggs, avocados rise, but also what rises is crime because of their policies. Our big cities and our small cities now have become unsafe. Can we afford their policies when it comes to the border being not secure? Now we're not only a flood of people coming across, it's those who are we catching on the terrorist watch list, but more importantly, the fentanyl that's coming across this country to kill our young Americans. It's the number one cause of death between the ages of 18 and 45. And now we're watching what's happening around the world. Can we afford their foreign policy? We watched this president say it's a difference between if Putin invades Ukraine a little bit or a lot. Now he just said yesterday he only warned the American companies that Russia was coming to hack them. He did nothing about stopping it. Why? Because earlier he told Putin just 16 places he shouldn't go. No, the real answer should be Russia should not challenge one American company ever. He's got to start finding solutions, but we see that he's lost in that process. That's the difference between the Republicans and Democrats. We're working here in this conference to come out with our solutions that we'll roll out to the American public to make sure that the next century is the American century. With that, let me bring up our whip, Steve Scalise. Thanks, Kevin. It's good to see so many House Republicans coming together uh, to work on real solutions to the crises that we're seeing all across this country. No matter where you go, people are talking about the same things. They're angry about the high prices they're paying. They're really angry with the far-left policies that Joe Biden and Speaker Pelosi have put in place that have gotten us to this point. You know, when you look at the high prices at the grocery store with a supply chain shortage, President Biden came in day one, uh, started paying people money not to work, created a supply chain crisis created a, a really, really tough time for our small business owners to get people working. When you look at the high prices that everybody's paying for gasoline, over five, six dollars a gallon that people are paying at the pump, they understand that it was Joe Biden who came in on day one and said no new pipelines, no new drilling for oil and gas in America, no new ability to export energy to our friends around the world. And it's no surprise that just a year and a half later, you've seen the prices skyrocket well over 50% of where they were just a year and a half ago when we were an energy independent country. We're coming together to put ideas on the table to solve these problems. Joe Biden in the past has said, you know, what's the Republicans' idea to, do, to fix this? Well, the good news is we're gonna have a lot of good ideas to fix the border crisis, to fix the gasoline increases that we've seen, to bring down gas prices, to address inflation, to allow parents to have a role in their kids' education. I'd be real interested to see what Joe Biden's approach will be when we're in the majority, when we put those bills on his desk. Will he sign or veto a bill to lower gas prices? We know he created these problems. People know that the spending that Joe Biden did when he walked in, not hundreds of billions, but trillions in new spending, are the things that are driving inflation. And they're fed up with it, but they really are excited when they hear about these solutions that we as Republicans are going to be rolling out later this year to go win back the House and start solving some of these problems that President Biden and Speaker Pelosi created. 
Now I want to bring up our conference chair, Elise Stefanik. Thank you, Steve. As House Republicans gather here, the stakes in our country could not be higher. Families across America have suffered crisis after crisis in just a little over one year of far-left Democrat one-party rule in Washington. As both the leader and the whip pointed out, America cannot afford Democrats' far-left socialist agenda any longer. Energy independence to having the President of the United States beg OPEC, Iran, and Venezuela to increase production. We went from safe streets, relatively safe streets, to record levels of crime, and we went from stable prices to a 40-year high inflation. And of course, we know what's happened in foreign policy, um, terrible situation uh, going on in Ukraine as we speak. And that doesn't even get into the, the task force that we've been focused on on the last year, which is what the Biden administration and Democrats have done to America's fundamental freedoms, fundamental liberties. You think about every single right you enjoy as an American under the First Amendment. Your right to practice your faith, your right to assemble, your right to petition your government, freedom of press, freedom of speech. Every single one has been assaulted by the left, not to mention what they've done to your Second Amendment liberties and, of course, what they tried to do to moms and dads who simply want to determine their children's education. So if the American people put us back in charge, we will be focused on all those issues, but in particular, the Judiciary Committee will be focused on defending and respecting the Bill of Rights, the Constitutions, and Americans' liberties. I now want to turn it over to the ranking member, uh, Michael McCall, on the China Task Force. Uh, thanks, Jim, and, and my thanks to Leader McCarthy for setting up these task forces. When I chaired Homeland Security Committee, we had the Terrorism Task Force, had legislative recommendations after Paris and Brussels were hit, uh, chaired the China Task Force, had legislative recommendations. Republicans are ready to lead, and we're going to have a plan of action to take to the American people this fall so there's a clear choice. If given the majority, we will tell you what our agenda is and what we will do to change the direction of this nation, which you've heard is on many bad tracks. Um, on the foreign policy side, with respect to China, we saw this meeting in Beijing with Mr. Putin, who is a mass murderer, meeting with uh, Chairman Xi of China, coming to an unholy alliance that they were going to be allies together not recognizing NATO or its aggression, as they call it. Russia saying, we will allow you to invade Taiwan. This has major ramifications moving forward. We can't make the same mistake of not arming Taiwan like we didn't arm Ukraine in advance. And then lastly, to see a hypersonic launch from China go around the world and land with precision that can carry a nuclear payload we don't have that technology. We can't stop it. But we can darn sure not export it to China anymore. Export control, stopping, you know, whatever they, they, we gave it to them, they either stole it or we sell it to them. And it goes into their war machine to turn against the United States of America under a Republican majority uh, that will stop. And with that, I'm, I'm honored to... Uh, uh, Kathy McMorris and I came in together into Congress. She's a ranking member on Energy and Commerce Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Big tech has become a destructive force. They shut down the battle of ideas. They've done it by censoring conservatives and political speech that they disagree with. One of the most stunning examples is playing out right now. We just learned what was obvious at the time, that the emails on Hunter Biden's laptop were indeed authentic. Yet before the 2020 election, big tech censored the New York Post and shut down this legitimate story. There's been other instances too. Big tech is flagging and suppressing information on the origins of COVID-19. Big tech has been colluding with the Biden administration who's actively flagging, quote, problematic content for these companies to censor. Big tech has not been a good steward of their platforms. In addition to censorship, big tech's business models, they manipulate and they harm our children. They crush competition. They harness and share an incredible amount of our personal information, and they are certainly not transparent. Our task force is working through proposals with members to address these problems. To stop censorship, we are looking at scrapping Section 230 for the largest tech companies and making sure that the new and smaller platforms can compete, have a fair chance to succeed by retaining the existing Section 230 pr uh, protections for them. We want to protect the free market. 
We also have proposals to strengthen antitrust review, encourage and require transparency, and put people in control of their data. We're focused on ensuring big tech listens to parents. I think about moms and dads. I've heard from that have no justice after the, their son purchased a, a pill that was laced with fentanyl off of Snapchat. Or the child who has committed suicide after being bullied on Facebook. They've all told me that they have nowhere to turn to get the answers from these companies. This must change. We plan to ensure big tech is held accountable for facilitating illegal activity and empower parents to connect with these companies when they need help. These are not easy solutions. Big tech has been abusing their power on so many fronts. There's, there's not a silver bullet. But our members on this task force have been engaged, we're committed to bringing forward the ideas that will hold big tech accountable. We're, we're looking forward to being able to hear from all the members of the conference this week and to be ready with the reforms on day one when we win the majority. Next, we're going to go to the ranking member of the Energy, Climate, and Conservation Task Force, Garrett Graves. Sorry, Garrett. <laughs> there's, a, there's a grandmother that's had to make the difficult decision to no longer go visit her grandchild uh, several times a week because she can't afford to refuel her car. There's a young single mom that's had to make the false choice between buying groceries, paying the electricity bill, or putting gas in the car to get to work. And there's a dad out there that has had to make a very, very difficult decision to withdraw their, their child from the football team because they can't afford to pay for the uniform and the increased energy cost. When, when people elect representatives, they expect just that. They expect people to represent them, whether it's somebody in the state legislature in Congress or the President of the United States. Uh, leadership, uh, Leader McCarthy, the Whip Scalise, they've, they've created these task forces to, to do just that, to, to, to force these major paradigm shifts in policy that actually represents the best interest of the American citizens. We've watched over the last 14 months or so, 15 months, as we've seen an administration act in the best interest of other countries, becoming more dependent upon other countries for energy resources while we've watched prices become completely unaffordable and to impact those that can least afford it. This, this administration's policies on energy, on climate, and on conservation have been complete failures. I'll say it again. We've seen prices skyrocket and become completely unaffordable because of their policies. We've seen greenhouse gas emissions spike, and we've seen energy security, energy independence that had been achieved under the previous administration entirely abandoned. There's a path forward recognizing the fact that global energy demand is going to increase by 50 percent. There's a path forward that the United States can, where the United States can play a leadership role in increasing energy resources for the United States citizens, for our allies, increasing affordability, reducing emissions, and ensuring that we once again achieve that objective of energy independence. Once again, focusing on the best interest of the citizens of America who we're supposed to be advocating for and representing. Uh, next, I turn to the American Security Task Force lead, Congressman John Katko of New York. Thank you. And uh, let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had a news day where you didn't talk about issues related to border security or cybersecurity or police and crime issues in the United States? It doesn't happen. And those are all the issues that we're dealing with on American Security Task Force. And they're, they're unbelievable issues. Regarding the border, we all know the border is wide open. We know that happened on January 20th uh, through a stroke of the pen by the president who rolled back a lot, of, a lot of border issues that were working. In addition to the millions of people coming across, many of whom are on the terror watch list that we've seized in the last year. In fact, the terror watch list is, seizures are at unprecedented levels. And in addition to that, we have a huge drug issue in this country. And as Kevin alluded to, for the first time in our nation's history, we have more than 100,000 drug overdose deaths. First time ever, and it's direct related to the border. Every town in this country, every, in every state in this country, is a border town and a border state because of it. And we got to fix that. And also, with respect to cybersecurity, five years ago, I would have told you, and Mike McCall would have told you when we were on Homeland Security together, that uh, homegrown, homegrown inspired violent extremism from ISIS was probably our biggest threat. Biggest threat now by far is cybersecurity. 
We saw it this week with respect to what President Biden himself said about cybersecurity. This task force will be dealing with that issue as well. And lastly, the crime issue in this country and the vilification of police officers and the defunding of police and the laws that have been passed that have destroyed a police officers' ability or their will to do their job are what we have to work on in this task force. And I'll just give you a couple of quick examples so you can have a couple of facts. I went to New York City and spoke to the police officers in New York City. They cut funding by almost one-sixth on New York, New York Police Department after, uh, after the George Floyd murder. The end result is an unbelievable spike in crime, and 97% of the shooting victims now in New York City are the very victims that these people on the other side think they're trying to help. That is minorities. It's not working. And now you see, you see the mayor of New York City, a Democrat, trying to turn back that tide. And what we're going to do with this task force, we're going to fix that issue too. These are tall issues. These are big issues. But on day one, we're going to have a legislative agenda ready for all of them. And I'm uh, proud to be part of it. And next, I want to uh, introduce Brett Guthrie from the Health Future Ta Task Force. Thank you. I'm co-chairing with Vern Buchanan as well. And, and thank you so much for uh, putting all this together, leadership. It, it's important. We're researching on the Healthy Futures Task Force, researching ideas uh, and listening to Americans to try to develop targeted solutions that modernize our healthcare system for lower costs and create more choices and more innovation. If you look at what the Democrats are doing in Washington, it's a one-size-fits-all, Washington knows best, top-down approach. And healthcare is too personal. It's too personal. Everybody has their individual needs and individual desires and individual wants, and it's not a government knows best approach that will work. So Republicans are different. We're going to look at what can help the individual. And we're looking specifically at, at and we're going to talk a little bit about the process, specifically things like what's going on in Washington today, illicit fentanyl. It's not permanently scheduled to be illegal. It's just mind-boggling that Speaker Pelosi won't bring a floor a bill to the floor, 70% of Kentuckians who died of an overdose in 2020 died of illicit fentanyl. It's just mind boggling. We saw what was going on with security in our supply chain with the pandemic and, re and reliance on China. What's going on with telehealth? Some things we learned from the pandemic that we can do better. Operation Warp Speed, a phenomenal thing that President Trump led in the last, in the last Congress that, uh, that really brought, showed that if government works together, and invest in the private sector and leases their potential that we can bring cures to the marketplace and to help people's lives. And I'll let my um, colleague talk about the process and what else is going on with our task force. Thanks, Brett. Um, I just want to thank the leader uh, and the leadership because um, whatever success I had in business over the years, I've always been very big on shared visioning and shared planning. And that's what we're doing is trying to get the best ideas in the conference and our districts as we take on the challenge in terms of health care. And one of the biggest things for me, why well, I'm excited about that, even though my focus the last couple of years is tax and trade, but one of the biggest things is affordability. And we can talk about where inflation is today, but as you look back 10 years ago as a guy that was an employer of a lot of people, uh, back then we paid all the insurance for working class families, and I'm a blue collar kid, so I sense that. All, the, all we paid for everybody, very little deductibles. And now the average family of four is paying $800 out of their pocket. And maybe the company, and I'm talking about our region, every region's a little bit different, but maybe the company could pay, uh, pays the other half. They pay $900, they can't afford it. So one of the big things we want to look at is affordability uh, in terms of just being, uh, where we're more focused and taking a look at best practices. But I, I love the idea of what we're doing right now, getting that input. So we're, instead of being reactive, we're proactive. And the idea after the election is hopefully if we get the majority is to get back and have a plan that we can implement in the first six months and then something short term that would be our short term plan then hopefully two years after that have an even more significant plan. But health care has to be fixed and there's a lot of opportunities but at the, t at the top for me is affordability. It's bankrupting middle class families. Yeah, thanks leader for putting these task force together and we'll turn it back to you. Well, let's go to Gary Palmer oh. first. I'm Gary Palmer. I'm chairman of the Republican Policy Committee, and I hope by now you realize that there's a theme here, that the representatives of these task forces are focused on policy and not politics. They're focused on improving the everyday lives of everyday Americans. Our energy policies are not only going to improve, uh, help us fight inflation, but it's also going to bring down the price of a gallon of gas and the price of a gallon of milk at the grocery store. We're focused on policies that will 
help us grow a nation that can be more prosperous, more secure, and more hopeful for the future. These are things that we are focused on, these task forces have been focused on for months now that we're bringing together for a commitment to America that I think will make a difference for every American uh, starting in November. The number one question every American is asking is, can we afford it? Can we afford the food costs? Can we afford the gasoline costs? Can we afford the Democrats' policy when it comes to crime, what continues to rise? Can we afford the Democrat policy when it comes to our border that's killing young kids throughout this country because of the fentanyl? Can we afford weak foreign policy that makes the world unsafe? Can we afford the Democrats' policy when it dismantles America's ability to become energy independent? The real answer is we cannot afford it. So as the Republicans here, we'll lay out an agenda, a commitment to America that if they will give us the opportunity to become the majority, that we will govern differently. We'll make the commitment to you to bring us energy independence, lower the inflation causing democratic policy, secure our border, make our streets safe again, and make peace through strength. With that, let me open up for questions, but thank all of you for coming to even cover our conference. Yes, ma'am. Of course, is a lot about policy, but I'm wondering how a number of, oh, thank you very much. I know that this is focused on policy, but I'm wondering how much you see some of these uh, policies that are going to be coming out of this retreat going to be playing a role as lawmakers begin to hit the campaign trail. Well, we make policy, but to make policy, you first have to get elected. So I believe the policies that we lay out to the American public will not only bring Republicans to the ballot box, but we're looking throughout the polling as well, from independents, from Democrats, from all aspects of America, they have rejected these democratic policies, and I think they'll be very open and welcoming to what we're laying out, having listened to them and drive. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mitch McConnell decided not to put out an agenda, so can you talk about why you thought it was important to put out a policy agenda, and what more can you tell us about timing and how much work you've already done on it? I, I think elections are important, but I think it's more important than just running against another party but tell the American public what you will do. For us to solve the problems in America, you cannot do it alone. We need the American public to join with us. And for American public to join with you and support you, they first want to know what will you do. Having spent the last year and a half listening to them, crafting the policy as we've gone through from the Parents' Bill of Rights, that we think parents should have a say in their kids' education. They should know what's being taught at the school. They should know if there's harassment or a, an incident on campus as well. We think the border should be secure. Why? Because we see it every single day, the challenge is what's causing. We don't think it's right that people on the terrorist watch list are walking into our country. We wonder why, who they're talking to, and what they have planned. We don't think it's right when we pick up the paper every single day and we see a new overdose. Just two weeks ago, I read of six young college kids that have overdose down in Florida. They're West Point kids. It can affect any single kid in the country. Two of them overdosed not because they took a drug, but because they gave CPR, not knowing that fentanyl was laced. That's happening in every single city. It doesn't matter your wealth, your gender, or the color of your skin. Why? Because fentanyl is coming from China across a border that is open into America. There's enough here today to kill every single American seven times over. That's the democratic policy. I think it's important that we lay out to the American public so they can join with us so we can make this difference. That's why we're doing it. Timing, when do you think it'll be released? Well, as you notice, there's a number of things we have already rolled down. As we focus more on this retreat, you'll see more as we go forward rolling out, and I believe by the end of the summer, you'll see the complete package, yes. Uh, in a couple of minutes, you'll be hearing from Newt Gingrich. Thank you. In a couple of minutes, you'll be hearing from Newt Gingrich speaking to you. He's participated in conference calls. Yeah, your agenda rollout has been described as something along the lines of a contract with America. How involved is he? Is he helping in consulting? Is he giving advice? Or um, I'm just curious what his level of involvement is. Newt has been a dear friend of mine and, and a mentor of mine for many of years. And uh, I, I've consulted Newt throughout all the time. Uh, I think he comes up with a lot of big ideas and good ideas. He was one of the individuals, if you notice, we don't have many speakers here on purpose. 
because we want the engagement from the members themselves coming up with this. But there's a few speakers we wanted to make sure we have. The number one I wanted to have, Newt. He watched a chance where Republicans, when no one thought you can win. If we're, if we're successful and we win 18 seats, that's the same as the 1994 revolution. But it's different than just recruiting candidates and raising money. It's what you do with it. You make a commitment to the American public. Stop this rising cost in everything we have. Gasoline, I just paid $6.59 in California. We could become energy independent. And we watch in the world today, it's not just your military that makes you strong. It's your economy and your ability for energy independence. God has blessed this nation with the ability to do it. It also blessed us with the ability to be an, an opportunity to send it to other countries. So they don't have to be beholden to Putin. You know what else happens, as Garrett Graves will tell you? American natural gas is 41% cleaner than Russian natural gas. If you care about the economy or if you care about the environment like we do, there's a better way to do it. And so what, what I see as we move forward is Newt can tell us kind of the challenges that he had. How did he do something that most people didn't think was possible? We only need five seats to win the majority. But the idea isn't to fight to win the majority. It's a fight to change the country, to lower the price of rising goods, to secure our borders, to make sure we're energy independent, to make sure our streets and schools are safe again, and make sure the next century is ours. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I know you guys are rolling out your NRCC um, internal polling today and, and talking to members about what that looks like, and it seems to have you poised to win back the House with the way things are going right now. And I'm wondering what that looks like next year when you have the majority. Will there be this bipartisanness that has been happening for the past few months over Ukraine, over things like violence against women, in arbitration, um, what will that look like in a, in a House, in a GOP-controlled House? Well, I'll tell you what it looked like in the House. On the very first day, members will have to start showing up to work. No longer will we have proxy votes. No longer will the Capitol be closed to the public. No longer will bills just be written in the Speaker's office and brought to the floor. We'll work in the committees itself. I took a number of members with me to MIT last week, where we spent two days where we looked at from AI to quantum. What I believe will have to happen in the next, no longer will we have an intel committee that's a political committee. But they missed what was happening in Afghanistan. They missed what was happening in Ukraine because they spent too much time doing politics for the last four years. I believe those who want to serve on intel or armed services should go through the six-week course, Republicans and Democrats alike, so they know the challenges of where we are and the threats but also our strengths and where we should invest. We should not sit back here and watch China and Russia to have a hypersonic missile and America struggle with it. We should be prepared for what the future holds. And so we will, we will act differently, but this Congress will be different. It will be focused on solutions. And we're willing to work with anybody that wants to work on solutions. But I'll tell you what will be a challenge. I cannot believe that we have a majority party that not one of them in their conference has ever brought up the rising pr prices of gasoline. Not one of them. <clears throat> has there been one family in America that hasn't brought it up to each other about how much they're playing for gas? But in the majority in Congress, maybe that's why they haven't done anything about it. Listen, we'll have the courage to listen to the American public, but we'll have the wisdom to lead. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, you all have forces are not just to propose but also roll out a number of policies you all hope can get done if you're in the majority. Um, I think one of you actually said focus on the policies and not the politics. There is a group in your own conference that does tend to focus more on the politics and I'm curious to hear from you how are you going to make sure that if you do regain the majority you all do remain united to deliver on a number of policies. I think what you see right now you see a united conference. You see, just behind me, people are in different conferences and all, but they all belong to one conference, the Republican Conference. They will all make a commitment to America. They'll all focus on keeping that word to the American public. I think you'll be in very impressed what we're able to do. Unfortunately, we're at a conf uh, at our conference is a little different than the Democrats. 
They let buses run for eight hours, only because their own internal conference couldn't decide whether they would vote for their appropriation bills, just the rule. They continue to fight with one another. I don't see that in our conference. And the one thing I will say to the American public, you may not have looked at the Republican Party in the last couple of years. We want you to relook at us. We want you to give us your input. We want you to join with us. Because we think it's more important that America wins than the idea that you're too afraid to stand up to fight for lowering the gas prices. We think there's an opportunity for everybody in this party. All right, last question. Thank you. Um, you talked about foreign policy, China, Taiwan. I just want to ask you, what lessons have the U.S. learned from the Russia's invasion of Ukraine and that could be a guide uh, in shaping its relation with Beijing? So you talked about this, but can you please explain how should the U.S. prepare for a potential crisis in Taiwan? Okay, the first thing, if you're talking about Russia invading Ukraine, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. The first one was how this president got out of Afghanistan, creating 13 more Gold Star families. The second lesson that should be learned is don't allow Putin to control a certain industry in a certain continent. By denying America to being energy independent at a pipeline, but allowing a pipeline for Putin sends all the wrong messages. Be very clear on what you believe. So a president shouldn't stand in the White House and say, it's different if Russia invades Ukraine and tries to take it all over than a little bit. That sends a wrong message as well. So what I would tell is take the lessons from here and apply them to Taiwan. Don't put American troops in harm's way. Let Taiwan defend themselves. So stop holding up weapon cells to Taiwan. Let them defend themselves. Also what you need to do is do not let China corner markets. When you look at what happened in America, just from our medical supply, when you look what China is doing when it comes to critical minerals, you, when you look time and again what China has done on stealing our technology. You know, I was at the 75th anniversary of Normandy, and I was walking the graves with the speaker. And when you look at the graves and the names on them, they either have a Star of David or a cross. They're all pretty close in the same age, and they all died in about the same time. And you wonder the exact same question you asked me, I asked myself. What could we have done as a nation? Not on that day, but the years before, so that day never happened. Well, I think Russia invading Crimea, we should have said something different. I think creating an agreement with Iran that allowed them to have a, a nuclear weapon in a certain time frame, but also billions of Americans' dollars, and they funded terrorism around the world, and you said nothing? I think that built into Ukraine getting invaded as well. I went to Pelosi, the speaker at the time, and I asked, could we create a committee with an equal number of Republicans, an equal number of Democrats, to look at the industries that China has cornered the market on? It took me eight months to finally get her to say yes. We had the Washington Post come in and actually interview the people we were going to appoint. And the night before the appointment, they called me and said no. How can we have hundreds of thousands of Americans killed by COVID, but a government that will not look and know where the origins have created? How can you have an attorney general that thinks terrorism is American parents who care to go to a school district meeting? How can you have an IRS department that's so powerful but will release Americans' tax returns? So it's not just policies we will do in the majority. We will hold this administration accountable. Those are the lessons we learned with Ukraine. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you.